All right, I think we are good. I love the lively chat we've got going. People are waking up. I'm going to introduce everybody here. Um, welcome you to day two of Brigade Congress. I'm M. Burnett, uh, network team member. I organize Open Main locally, um, the National Advisory Council member, a neighbor ish to our other panelists here, Nicole. I say ish, I don't know how far away we live from each other, but we're both in Portland, Maine today. Um, a couple housekeeping notes uh, to mention. You should have received a daily flyer this morning written with care about 10.30 in the morning, which has info on, on conferences. Though the voting and the pitches started yesterday. So Tim has been very diligently organizing us with this. We voted on sessions last night. There are going to be three different sessions today. Um, they are starting at 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific with Indigenous Innovation and Civic Tech by Ben Trevino. Um, we've then got a session at 3 p.m. on New York City and Ranked Choice Voting. And then at 4 p.m., uh, growing a core team during COVID, which I think we all uh, could benefit from participating in. We also have our Theory of Change session later at 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, which definitely invite you all to attend. Other things to note, we follow the Code for America Code of Conduct here. If you have any concerns, please raise them by emailing safespace at codeforamerica.org. Um, that includes remarks that people might have made in a chat, uh, anything that happens that might make you feel unsafe or like the, safe, the space is not um, supporting you, please report them. You can also contact me directly. Uh, Tim has, uh, Tom has linked this in the chat too. And I believe that is most of our housekeeping this morning. Um, thanks to everyone for, for getting up and joining another day of Zoom uh, on a Saturday. We're, we're really thrilled to have this conversation with uh, Jean and Nicole. So all of that being said, I will kick us over to Nicole Braddock, who's going to introduce our keynote this morning, Jean. Thanks, Em. So nice to have you guys all here. I can't believe you're all on, on a Saturday. Uh, it shows a lot of dedication, um, and I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'm really honored to be introducing my friend, Janet Ikes. Um, I've known her for a long time here. We both work in the sort of legal technology and access to justice technology universe. Um, I own a company called Theory and Principle. We're a product development shop based out of Portland, Maine, that works in the justice space, building custom apps globally. Um, and so uh, Jeanette currently is a research professor of law and director of the Center for Legal Innovation at Vermont Law School. She teaches a ton of things there, but um, I think most notably for the people here, she also teaches a course on building apps for social and environmental justice. And in fact, some of the students that she's had have built products that have actually gone on to become real, real world products that are making real impact. Um, the thing that I really like about Jeanette is that she truly is the real deal. We are in a space, uh, the space within which we work. Uh, there's a lot of overnight experts, um, but Jeanette has, uh, she not only has a JD, she's, so she herself is a lawyer, but she has uh, a master's in computer science and has led a computer science department, um, which I really enjoyed reading that her master's in 1999 was called uh, a master's in internet engineering. It made me very happy. <laughs> Um, and uh, so I think that she's particularly good at identifying, you know, what are things that are truly going to have impact uh, for the people that we're trying to serve uh, and also calling out the bullshit when there is that. So uh, I'm excited to hand it over to Jeanette and then I will be there at the end for some Q&A. Um, thanks again. Hello, everyone. Can folks see my screen? Yes. Excellent. All right. So thank you for having me. I am excited to be talking to Code for America. Um, 
I always look at the projects you're doing and think, you know, if, if not for law, I would be doing that. Um, so if I ever get tired of teaching in a law school, look for me at a Code for America group near you. Um, I really, I really appreciate everything that you do and the work you do. So today I'm going to talk about how the law and how civic engagement overlap. And specifically, I'm going to talk about this in, in the silo I live in, which is, which is law. Um, so I'm going to kick this off by giving you a flavor of what it was like in Vermont this morning when I woke up. Um, yeah, I've, I've done this since I started law school from Missouri in, in 1993. Um, I write the date of the first snowfall on the windshield of my car. This is one of the earlier ones. I think I've got one from 1013 about five years ago. Um, and then this one from, of course, 2020. Um, so I'll kick that off, kick this off with a little bit of flavor from, from Vermont. Um, I'm going to start off today by talking about the challenges we face in the legal industry, um, notably how to get people access to justice. Um, we have an access to justice problem. There's no question that we have an access to justice problem. People are not able to get legal and professional services when they need them. So everyone's familiar with a right to an attorney, right? You, you've You've heard a cop show that's, that's read somebody the Miranda rights. You have a right to an attorney, and if you cannot afford one, one will be appointed for you by the court. This is only for criminal law cases. Everything else you have a problem with in life that impacts the government or the legal system, you're on your own. Good luck to you. So what are some of those things that we see and they're called civil cases. What are some of the things we see in civil cases? We see family law, the dissolution of a marriage, divorce. We see health, health law. We see housing and real estate law. We see evictions. We see disability law. We see contract law. We see tort law. We see all sorts of different types of law that come under this, this large umbrella of civil cases. And you are not guaranteed in the United States any kind of legal representation. You have to pay for it. So what is this access to justice called when we don't have, when we, if we had it in civil cases? It would call, be called civil Gideon. All right. And civil Gideon would be the idea that we were guaranteed some type of attorney or legal legal professional to support us in our court filings and in a court, court of law. So since we don't have that guarantee, um, we do a lot of studies as a legal industry on, on what is the justice gap? You know, why, how, how do people not have access to civil legal needs and have them met? Um, and who doesn't have that access? So these are the realities of today. People who have civil legal problems don't have a way forward. If you have a civil legal problem and you have a divorce or you have a contract dispute or your neighbor's tree falls on your car, um, you would call the, the court and they would tell you to find an, an attorney or they would point you to some forms that you have to complete. Um, in some cases, they might point you to small claims court, which is designed for people to proceed without an attorney. Um, it's not enough. It's insufficient representation. Um, when people go into court without an attorney, the judges are uncomfortable, the people are uncomfortable, they don't know how to object, they don't know how to make the right arguments. Um, all law is, is a rule book for how to play the game in the courts. Um, and it, it governs all of the procedures with how we engage with the courts and with government. Um, and oftentimes you, you want a lawyer on your side. So poll number one, please. And hopefully, um, 
you, the moderator will be talking to me here. I think we yes. have a poll coming up in the chat. I'm going to hit launch poll. My only thing is I might not have done it right, but we're, we're going to charge forward. Let's see if it works. Yeah, okay. okay. It just launched all of the questions at once. So <laughs> please respond to the first poll. What percentage of low-income households do you think have experienced at least one civil legal issue in the last year? So of that laundry list of, of civil legal issues, what percentage of these low-income households do you think have a civil legal issue in the last year? Do we get to see the results here, Em? I don't think you okay. can submit to just question one. I think you have to do the whole poll. Okay. Oh, no. Well, while, while you continue, I will endeavor to fix this and maybe okay. start with poll number two. All right. So I will go back over here and show you that 71% um, of low income households. So I need to move M. She's sitting right in the middle of the slide. 71% um, of low-income households have experienced a civil legal problem in the past year. And this is the interesting side note. The rate is higher for some. Households with survivors of domestic violence or sexual assault, 97% of them experience a civil legal problem in the past year. Um, parents with guardians, or parents and guardians of kids under the age of 18, 80%, and disabled persons, 80%. The percentage is also high for senior citizens and, of course, no surprise to anyone, veterans. So domestic violence is one of the areas where we're falling down on the job. We are not offering direct and easy access to temporary restraining orders, things that would protect people in domestic violence situations. Okay, this is the next poll, M. Do we have any luck on number two? In about 15 seconds, all this right. will be relaunched for us all to vote. I'm just gonna hit save, and then let's see how that works. All right. Save, polling, do, do, do. Okay. So what do you think the most common civil legal issue in the U.S. is among low-income Americans? Is it health, consumer finance? This includes debt and things like bankruptcy, housing, children and child custody, education, disability, or income maintenance. What do you think is the most common civil legal issue in the U.S.? Are we getting some results in? We are. Okay, well, what are the results? Okay, 82% of people have been voting here. I think I can end poll and then we Sounds will good. share the results. Do you folks Excellent. see that? Interesting. So health is 3%. Housing and child custody issues um, were the highest percentage. So let's see what the actual result of the survey is here. Maybe. Okay, so what are the common civil legal problem areas? Healthcare and health related issues. 41% of those annual legal issues are healthcare issues. Consumer and finance is 37%. Housing rental eviction is 29%. Children in custody is only 27%. Education, disability, and income maintenance make up the rest. Now, obviously this totals up to more than 100%, so you need to know that people may have selected more than one choice. All right, so the next poll, because um, I have a bunch in a row here. 
What percentage of the households below the federal poverty level seek legal assistance? So what percentage of the 60 million people who are at the poverty level actually seek legal assistance for their problem, what I would call problems in daily living that aren't medical, right? Because, or criminal, right? Lawyers, law, doctors play God with your body and lawyers play God with everything else. Um, and here, is, here are those legal issues. So what percentage of these households seek legal assistance? This number will perhaps surprise you. Do we have some results? You can unmute yourself, M. That might be easier. All right. Zero to 25%. You guys are good. All right. So the answer is 20%. Low-income Americans seek professional legal help for only 20% of the civil legal problems that they face. So the next question I have for you is what percentage of those individuals received inadequate or no legal assistance? So of the 20% of people that ask for legal assistance, what percentage of them received inadequate or no legal assistance? Absolutely right, more than 70%. How much more than 70% you might wanna know? 86% of the civil legal problems reported by low-income Americans in the past year received inadequate or no legal help. Only 28, only 2.8, pardon me, percent of the low-income individuals with legal needs are receiving useful legal services. So this sounds like a Code for America piece, right? This sounds like something we can do something about. Um, so what we have in the U.S. is justice for the top 5% who can pay for it and the bottom 2.8% who manage to navigate all of, all of the hurdles to actually get legal assistance. So, is it just a problem with our system? No, it's not just a problem with our system. The legal profession is a contributing factor in the problems we say, see in the legal and the access to justice world, right? So, hourly billing does not equal efficiency. What do I mean by this? Well, I mean, lawyers have no incentive to be faster at what they do. They make money by the hour. It's a problem. It does not encourage them to move more quickly. We have limited resources, so we don't have enough lawyers to serve all of the needs. Um, this quote just breaks my heart every time I see it. Um, a woman in an abusive situation, when she comes to a legal aid program, is asked, are there children in the household? If the answer is no, she's turned away. She cannot get legal help in an abusive situation. And this is a quote um, that Jim Sandman often trots out when he is talking about legal services. Um, and he is now retired from the Legal Services Corporation, I believe, but he, he headed it for years and years. And um, the stories he tells about the unmet needs in this country regarding people in crisis, um, particularly family law matters, folks that really need our help. So this is another part of the problem, right? So we have a bunch of need for one-on-one -on -one legal services. Um, the, the fancier way to think about this is what we call bespoke legal services. So it's custom, right? It'd be like writing a separate piece of software for every, every individual user so they could have it tailored to the way they need it. Um, 
one-on-one -on -one legal service does not scale. It's not a drop in the bucket, right? It's barely a drop in the bucket. It's that 2.8%, right? So to meet the needs of people who are evicted, who are homeless, who are not getting the services we need, we need to scale these services and we need to make them more affordable. Now, what is another bar that lawyers have and the legal profession has for this? Um, it's something called the unauthorized practice of law. You're prohibited from practicing law without a license. Most of you probably in some way have heard this, um, that that you're not allowed to practice law without a license. Um, there's some transformation happening here and we're seeing a little bit of evolution, but this is really um, stopping us from bridging the access to justice gap. Um, when we have a limited number of people providing these services, we have created a tremendous pent up demand for legal services in our country and we're not meeting that expectation or need. And I, I'm gonna leave this section with, with one troubling thought. Our access to justice challenge that so many people face is a feature rather than a bug of the legal profession. And what do we mean when we, when we call it a feature, not a bug? For those of you that are, that are programmers out there, you probably already know what I'm talking about. Um, it's intended by the profession to ensure the guild and the survival of the lawyer lawyers, right, um, in our income. So you go to law school for three years, you learn the secret handshake, you take the bar exam, um, and some years much more successfully than in 2020, and you practice law. And there is a limited number of people who practice law, and there are a lot of people with legal needs and unmet legal needs. So the last really big problem that we have is what I often hear my students say. Um, my students tell me that they were smart people in college and they, some of them even went to graduate school, but they were bad at math. They didn't do technology. And so they became lawyers and they want to help people. What they, what they really want to do is make money counseling folks, right? Because lawyers care and they genuinely do in most cases, care about people, but they wanna do it one-on-one. -on -one. They, they wanna reach out to people and, and support them and, and be the hero and, and save them. Um, and they wanna do that on a one-to-one -one basis. And as we said before, scale, legal services don't scale and it's a problem. So change is coming. Um, and as I noted before, there's been some modification of of the UPL, the Unauthorized Practice of Law rules. Um, some states have what we're calling a sandbox to change legal regulation. Um, LegalZoom came on the market and is, is directed towards the, the folks between the 5% and the 2.8 that, get, that, get that don't get legal services. So, so we're seeing some consumer products. Um, so some change has arrived. This is the other thing we're seeing. We're seeing legal aid reaching for technology to help scale their services. This is a shot from the New York Times, and this is when um, the Trump administration decided that we would not allow people from certain foreign countries in. And these are the people who were doing the on-the-ground work at Kennedy Airport to help people get into our country. So today's challenges, which are access to justice and, and some challenges specific to the legal, the legal profession, are being met with some new ideas. And what are those new ideas? It's the idea that law is computational in nature, right? It can be data-driven, it can be rules-driven, and, and you'll see at the bottom we have prediction tools, we have natural language processing. What does that mean? That means you go to Google and Stanford's working on a project where you go to Google, you type in your legal problem, and it comes back with something on in the sidebar that helps you get the information you need to make an informed decision about your legal work problem. Um, we're, we're talking about visualizing the law, and I'm gonna show you an example of that in a minute. Um, expert systems, we're talking about self-executing law, smart contracts and blockchains, folks. Um, computable code and contracts that will sort of 
the best example of this is one click purchasing at Amazon, right? That is a contract you sign every time you click. All right, so legal reform is happening. We're starting to make courts more efficient and COVID has really changed the way courts perceive some things. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to hear that people are actually getting to phone in to status updates. It used to be a half an hour, we're in Vermont, right? So it's a half an hour to an hour to the court in the car to go in for a five minute status conference to drive another half an hour to an hour back. And most attorneys bill for that. So what you're seeing is people who can't afford legal services because it's inefficient. Now they're calling in and providing a five minute update for a status conference. This is a much more efficient way to do business and it should have been done ages ago. And in most courts, at least in Vermont, it wasn't happening that way. So we're starting to see some legal reform. Silicon Valley is providing us some solutions. So we're gonna see a future of law where we have access to law through technology-enabled justice and technology-enabled legal apps. And I've got parenthetically here, and it's a whole nother keynote, justice-enabled technology, which means we have algorithms that are actually open so you can see what kind of decisions they're making and whether there's any racial bias built into our algorithms. Um, so the question I have for you is, what legal services areas have the greatest representation among commercial legal tools? Now, we did the survey earlier that told you what kind of different um, demands there were. So why don't you look through these and select the one that you think is going to see the greatest representation among commercial tools? So do we have some results? We do. All right. What do folks oh, think? People are still voting a little bit. All righty. All right. In the poll. Real estate. All right. This this may surprise and nobody nobody supports civil rights. Yeah, unfortunately, you're probably right on that one. Okay, so criminal, 51% of the commercial apps are crim for criminal situations, 31 for family, consumer 25, real estate 23. Look at what's at the bottom. It's health. Now, for those of you that were thinking about it and paying attention to our, our our information from before, and we can, I'm going to revisit that survey here. Uh, which was the one that shows the most need among these folks? Where is the most demand? Health and consumer and finance. These are not what is well represented among the commercial legal tools. So there's some real opportunities to make an impact in these areas. So instead of seeing this as a problem, because we could, we could look at this and say, oh, clearly they're only doing it where there's money and where they know they're going to get paid, right? When it's your freedom on the line and you could be going to jail, you're gonna get paid. Um, it's an opportunity and it's an opportunity for civic groups like Code for America, for lawyers who are interested in change to collaborate and work together to at least help resolve some of these issues. And so what are lawyers and technologists doing together to, to resolve some of these issues? Um, we're providing legal guides for citizens. I, I'm highlighting LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer here. Um, these, these two services are commercial. They provide document automation. So you need a will, you need uh, to, to create a business and start a business in your, in your state. Um, do you need to file the first forms for a divorce? All of these different things are available on these commercial tools. And the commercial tools, frankly, are trying to serve the unserved, not the underserved, which are the low income or 
folks in the United States, but the unserved, which is actually a large swath of people in the middle. We also have court offered systems. So like in Vermont, we have a family law system that helps people file family law petitions. Um, and they do this, it's DIY, right? So you can go in, you can do it yourself. The reason in Vermont at least, and I know in most other states, 82% um, of the, the litigants in a divorce proceeding proceed pro se. What that means is they go in without a lawyer. Um, so they really need help and they need guidance. So the courts have stepped up and said, okay, we're going to at least get you the right form so you can file the right things. Um, in Nevada, they have a one-stop shop business portal. For those of you who, who run a business, you know that there's some annual fees you've got to pay, you've got to do an annual report, you've got to do all of these things like operating agreements and entity formation and DBA forms, doing business as forms, so you can have the right to use a name in your state. And in places like Nevada, they have a one-stop shop for doing all of this, and it's a government-supplied tool. These are opportunities for, for folks to work with states where they don't have this. Um, and Silver Flume was actually funded completely um, by a Harvard Law Lab project. Um, and they got funding from Pew. So, and it was, I think it was a $3 million grant that created this portal. And this was some years ago. So there's money out there to support and help folks that want to move in these directions. Um, this is another first, um, it's an app called Do Not Pay. Um, he started out, he's a Stanford student, and he started out doing this wonderful how to fight your parking ticket app. <laughs> and it turns out that generally just, just filing some basic forms will allow you to avoid paying your parking ticket. And he took advantage of that and created an app to help people do that and charged a small fee less than the parking fee and people were happy to do pay. Um, Do-it-yourself solutions. Um, one of the things we want to do is triage court involvement. Courts are backed up. Um, I was talking to someone the other day who had, was investigating filing a small claim in Vermont. Turns out they're a year and a half out before they even start to hear your claim once you file. Seems to me that it's better to keep the courts out when we possibly can. So there are solutions that are being created to do that kind of thing too, alternative justice systems. Um, this is a way that we make lawyers more efficient. This is a code for BT project, um, BTV, um, code for Burlington, Vermont. And working with Vermont Legal Aid, they created a Chrome plugin that helps the expungement lawyers complete um, the necessary forms and look up the necessary um, criminal records to complete the expungement forms. So what we're, what we're looking at here is, is actually their Chrome plugin. Um, notice they only have 56 users of this Chrome plugin. That's because that's how many lawyers are doing expungement in the, in the state. It's not many. Right, and this is why, in part, we have such a uh, such an access to justice problem. Um, in this case, um, the the folks that worked on it at Code for Burlington note that it changes a 90-minute process to a 20-minute process. So we're really creating some efficiency for the lawyers here. This is something my students created in the Building Apps for Social Justice course. And this is an app they called Driving While Black. Um, the idea of, of this app was that it trained a camera on the window and it, and it called in to a line for lawyers who would advise the individual in the car what to do at a police stop. Um, this came about because one of the students um, it was an African-American, he's a big guy. Um, and at one point, and he, he drove Georgia plates, and at one point Vermont State Troopers pulled him over and held him on the side of the road for three hours. 
Now, this was offensive enough to him, but what really ticked him off is his dog was locked in a car in the summertime and the police would not let him take that dog out, put it on a leash and be safe. So not only were his civil rights violated, he was emotionally distraught during the whole process. So we have an opportunity here to create a connection between lawyers and potential defendants or pe potential people in crisis to get them legal advice at the time they need it. Modria, um, which is now I think a different name because it was you know a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the legal tech area, um, but Modria, the idea of Modria was to resolve disputes online without the courts, without anybody else involved. It's dispute resolution online. So you go on and the computer resolves the disputes. Colin Rule, who was the founder of Modria, um, also worked for eBay. And so dispute resolution on eBay, as I'm sure you might imagine, um, was a thorny issue. And so he created this tool that actually claimed to resolve 87% of the issues brought to it without the involvement of courts or an attorney just a computer and two parties. That's pretty amazing. So we have some alternative ways to do this. This is where design thinking comes in. Um, these are vendor laws in New York State, um, or in, I'm sorry, the city of New York. And what's great about this is they decided when they realized how many different languages they'd have to translate this brochure into, that images might be their best tool for relating legal guidance. Um, and so this does a really nice job of telling you the distance you have to be from all of the different points um, in order to set up your street vending in the city of New York. So design thinking is not something lawyers are good at. Um, I like to, there's a book by Steve Krug, it's old now, it's called Don't Make Me Think. Um, and it's this, the example he used in the book is the, the notion of a doorknob. When we move in and out through an entryway and we use a door, we never stop and think about turning the knob to go through that door. Now, when we have to stop and think, and we've all been to those stores, right, where we're, we're like school for the gifted and we're trying to get into the door that's, that's a swing towards you and not a swing away from you. Um, when they have to stop and think, that's bad design. And a lot of law is not designed so citizens can access it. Established trust virtually, we're talking about smart contracts and blockchain, right? This helps people feel secure in what they're doing. Educate the citizens. A lot of people don't know they have a legal issue. In fact, 56% of the people when asked, ask about the issues they were having didn't recognize that the issues they were having were legal issues. I use the what happens when your tree, when your neighbor's tree falls on your car example. Most of us would call our insurance company. We would not call our lawyer, even though it's a tort. Um, so how about creating some games that just do basic education about when to call a lawyer, when you need legal advice, when to get in touch with legal aid? And some states are starting to do this. So what more can we do? Well, I'm gonna disclaim this by saying, there's the unauthorized practice of law. And whether that is just the guild of lawyers trying to keep all of the fees to themselves um, to the detriment of those that need access to legal services, I, I won't speculate further. Um, however, I would say to you that when you go to create something, it's best to partner with a lawyer or legal aid. So find somebody that's a stakeholder that's interested in justice and moving access to justice forward and partner with them. There's another reason for this. So I showed you the expungement thing, the, the nice little Chrome app that we created in Burlington. Yeah, turns out some folks in Maryland have done it and created the Chrome extension. And they're not alone. The folks in Massachusetts have done it. The folks in Kentucky have done it. The folks in Arkansas have done it. And the list goes on. So it's an opportunity to collaborate. Why are we reinventing the wheel? Why aren't we working together? We need to collaborate on these tools, 
right? This looks like a GitHub legal tech site, doesn't it? That we run through maybe Code for America or a legal tech group where people look for an app that's already been created, change it up a little bit and fork it to make the next project because state laws vary, right? And you may have to make some adjustments, but you don't have to start from scratch. So these are some of the Code for America legal projects. They were kind enough, folks at Code for America were kind enough to send these to me and I'll make this presentation available afterwards. Um, and hopefully I think we can share a link um, to this as well. Yes. Um, and there are plenty of projects out there. So I encourage you all to get involved in a project that has to do with access to justice. It's one of the, it's one of the really important needs in the United States that's completely unmet and very under, underspoken of. We don't, we don't talk about the access to justice problem. And what's the other thing you can do? There are all these hackathons for justice all over the place. Sign up, build a small app with a big impact. Make a difference. So what I would say is the train is here. Be an engineer. So create an app, build an app, design the app so it, it works with what the citizens, it meets the needs of citizens. Help people get to the app. Advertise that there are these apps and you don't have to start from scratch. What I would encourage you not to do is stand in the tracks, right? And so Code for America has, has done a great job and, and I've, I'm ending here with their, with their tagline, which is we're focusing on impacting lives at scale. And if there is any profession that needs scaling, it's the legal profession. So help us. Thank you. We have some great questions in the chat. I don't know if you want Excellent. to. Um, Maybe let's end the screen share. Perfect. Have just some cameras going. Um, so Renee has some some great questions here. Um, I'm happy to read some of them out. And also Tom and Nick have have some in the Q and A box. Do you want to check them out and see where you all want to start? I actually noticed Nick's question that I'd love to quickly address because um, it's in line with the event happening next week. Um, he asked, what is the best place to connect with attorneys who want to connect with technologists in a volunteer sense? Um, so one of our missions at my company has been to try to bring civic tech and access to justice tech together for a lot of the reasons that Jeanette just identified. There's, there's a lot of product overlaps, project overlaps, and a lot of things we can learn from each other. Um, so on Wednesday of next week, we're holding a free session. Um, I'm doing a quick overview of what's happening in A to J tech and Sid Harrell, that the famous Sid Harrell is doing a talk on what's happening in civic tech. Um, and it's intended to be like mostly networking so that people from these communities can talk to each other. I'll, oh, and just put the link in there. Awesome. It's, it's free, pop in for five, 10 minutes. Um, we also run a Slack channel that again is it's, it's called the design and justice tech collaborative I forget uh, but it's again it's intended to allow for a lot of that cross pollination and people to connect with each other in from these different communities and I jump in and add that a lot of law schools today have legal tech labs or legal labs um, find one at a law school near you look for them sometimes they're hard to find there is probably at your local law school a professor that's engaged in doing this and would love to have coders they have all kinds of students that want to that have great ideas and I know the code for America people could partner with the law school folks and do a great job here and really move things forward and these would be po pro bono projects in the legal term this is free projects right where we're we're offering civil aid for no cost to people so lots of great opportunities there and the other thing i'll note is um i was making some jokes in the chats when you were showing some of the products about design um <laughs> Yeah. We have we have a serious issue with design in these these sort of consumer facing products, um, and I think if you're a designer willing to lend a hand, um, that that will save save I, a lot of frustration and actually have people use these these products that are coming out of all these. I do I do a module with my students on um, legal design, and I start it by saying that 
the legal industry has a user interface problem. Um, and it's across the board. It's not just the software, right? Um, we're bad at it. And so designers out there, people who do design thinking, we need help. <laughs> help us <laughs> before we commit more errors. I have a talk that I've done a few times called The Law Has an Interface Problem. It's all about well, there that. you go. Both in our tech yeah. and in, in how people generally uh, respond to the law and are, you know, even like the summons we send people, their experiences with the police, it's all bad. <laughs> <laughs> and and we've seen right civ civilly we've seen all of that unrest related to just how bad the government interfaces with with people and mm -hmm. the playbook for that is law right yeah absolutely um i'm looking at renee's question and it's about the specific issue of landlords telling tenants uh that there is some requirement that is not actually a federal state law requirement and then take looks like taking them to hud for mediation of complaints um so i don't know i i have not seen that this particular issue of saying that like there are on, only a certain amount of people in a room uh can live in a room I, i've not seen that issue yes, come up. yes i have okay um perfect. it's particularly salient in immigrant communities um and so when the landlord is correct as if it's a hud housing unit right and that's when HUD is probably the first step in resolving that complaint. Um, it's not a good process. Um, they should have other rights outside of that. And certainly during COVID, right, there is a CDC um, eviction bar right now. So, you know, all you have to do is is meet those requirements that the CDC has put out and evictions aren't aren't happening. Um, so people should so I'm, there, re I'm reading a pop up. So there sorry. are a bunch there are a bunch of um, products right now that are helping people. We're, we're building one for the city of Indy right now to let, allow people to sort of generate yeah. those forms, um, right. which are really, really simple but they just need people need to know about them people need to hear that those those, those things are available to them and I, I think that that's one of the things that this technology really can can do is to scale an understanding of what your rights and responsibilities are with respect to the law and that's like most of the products Absolutely. we build have some component of that and education just and and that comes back to you know those of you that are interested in games create a game explain the law in an area why not have a landlord eviction game you know and the game can guide people through the right path mm -hmm. to get help right and and at least let people know what they should expect um it makes them advocate advocates for themselves um and that's really critical i think especially in a in a time when we don't have enough lawyers and enough access to justice Jeanette, I think this one is for you. Can you dig into health as an unmet need with respect to civil law? What are some examples of common legal issues that people face in that area? So I'm going to speculate a little bit on that one um, because I don't know what Sandiford was looking at when she mm -hmm. when she saw that. Um, and that, that survey, by the way, is um, one that came from Rebecca Sandiford's work. And she does a lot of work in this area. If you're ever interested in finding out more, Rebecca Sandiford does great things here and great. She's work. actually like the one researcher we have in this area. <laughs> There's very little research. She's done it all. And she's a sociologist. She's not she's a lawyer. Great. So so she does great work. Mm -hmm. um, so health, I'm going to assume and jump in here, Nicole. Um, I'm going to assume that the health needs that are unmet are denial of of some kind of like Medicare, Medicaid, um, and denial of those sorts of um, what am I trying to say here? Um, benefits. Right? Yeah, I so, think this this stuff has a lot of overlap with Code for America, the type of things that Code for America is interested in, because I think it really is benefits administration, benefits disputes, right? Uh, that sort of thing. Right, um, and probably some veteran benefits, healthcare benefits as well, right? Um, so all of those sorts of things, um, mm -hmm. disability declarations, and what accounts for disability. Um, and, and what kind of age you can get if you have a disability, probably all fall into and around health. So those are some of the common issues that people mm -hmm. face. Yeah, um, let's see what else we got here. 
would attorneys have trouble with our code being open and free, even if they work pro bono, sort of in the sense of protecting the guild? Um, so, <laughs> so we, 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 our clients. Should we be are, honest? <laughs> my, so, I, you know, we've been building products in this space for a long time, and I think zero of them have been open source because the client doesn't want to open source them. Um, right. But usually it's, it's, it's oftentimes fear of nefarious actors. Like, you know, we built an app in Chicago to help low income tenants navigate their legal needs. And the concern with open sourcing that is that the, the shitty landlords would find that code and figure out, you know, how we're talking. I don't know. They, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear of what open sourcing can mean. And um, it's been a challenge for sure. And it has been also funder requirements. A lot of funders, I think a lot of them will build and then the funder will be like, well, if people want this code, maybe we can sell this stuff. <laughs> Nobody ever well, does. Nobody ever does any of that. But. What is interesting is the product called Community Lawyer that's come along. And it's a no-code solution that's enabling lawyers to create their own apps. Lawyers shouldn't create their own apps, generally speaking. Um, you know, if if they understand how to do it, that's one thing, and they've had some training. It's a totally different thing when they haven't. Um, they should be part of a team that creates an app. But Community Lawyer has a GitHub-like setup that allows you to create an app as open source and fork it and allow people to use the source code and, and move in a different direction or address a different state's law. So I'm I'm very excited about the direction that Community Lawyer has has provided here. So Community Lawyer is leveraging an open source platform called DocAssemble, which in the access to justice community is is our, it's like our one open source success story. But mm -hmm. when you look at it, uh, there's like five people who have commits, like 99% of the work is done by the one guy, Jonathan Pyle, who started it. Um, so I don't think we're really realizing like, the, the glory and benefits of open source in this community because there are not a lot of people working in this space. Um, but within within the community lawyer platform, you can fork within that platform. So you're not restricted to DocAssemble. symbol. And in fact, they've had some scalability issues with DocAssemble, symbol. So they actually just rework, they forklift the whole thing. And they're they're now writing it with underlying Java. So this is not, it's no longer DocAssemble. symbol. It's built hmm based around the concepts of doc assemble um toma was was just gave a le guest lecture in my class a, a mm -hmm. week ago otherwise i wouldn't know that um but yeah that's so they hit scalability issues but other folks are using that and they're they're doing that initial work for their state and then other states are picking it up. There were three CDC eviction apps posted in community lawyer within the first 24 hours of the CDC Mm -hmm. posting that that notice about eviction and the moratorium yeah. on eviction. Yeah, it, there's a lot of patterns. Like I think most of the apps you'll see in this space have one of two functions and they're often combined together. One is some form of expert system. Because again, as Jeanette was saying, right. you know, law is essentially code. There's it's just a bunch of if, if this, then that statements. And, um, and then they often will either lead to some output, which is like maybe, you know, here's a referral source or here's, Here's you know, some law you should know about, but a lot of times they lead to document assembly. Here's a form that you should go send to your landlord. Um, and that those are super common. And so you know, the, it, it makes a lot of sense why we would have that as open source, but <clears throat> we build a lot of those products and we never leverage DocAssemble because we found it to be too limiting for what our needs are as well. Um, so we're still working on it. I still have hope that we're we'll, getting there. We're getting as a community. There. Well, and, and I think that, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have, which is why I always have envy for code for America projects, um, is, you know, the our ability to get data in and out of courts, our ability to work directly with court systems, um, hampers a lot of potential innovation. And, um, you know, at least, you know, code for America can, you know, most of our clients don't have budget to, you know, spend all that time really trying to bang down the doors of the court, the courthouses to try to get that data. Um, but there are some efforts now, um, Georgetown Law, has um, an, a group that is working hard on creating some data standards around from between legal aid organizations and court systems and trying to create a universe where APIs are available. Um, yep. And there are some, you know, right now we're working on a project in Wisconsin. They had an available API. We were able to pull all the circuit court data very easily, but that is like 
very few and far between. So, And um, here's another civic volunteer opportunity for you folks. As the different bar associations and courts are signing these nefarious contracts with the technology folks that <laughs> lock down the data, volunteer to be on their committees that review these contracts. Jeez. Mm. Any, no coder in their right mind would read these contracts and agree to them. Yet the lawyers are because they don't understand where the gotchas are in the contracts. Um, I'll use the state of Vermont as, a, as an example since we were bad and we recently, we recently agreed with a company in Texas who shall remain nameless, um, who- Also in Maine. Oh, good. Substantial presence in Maine. Oh, yay. Um, so they, they locked us down. They basically said, okay, you won't have to pay for your online court system, but we're going to charge per claim or per document submitted to the online court system. So now they're charging for all of this, and the lawyers who were doing pro bono work are having to pick up these fees. So the savings for the state has really just passed it on to low-income individuals, the problems to low-income individuals and the charges. So we're resting our court innovation on the backs of those that can ill afford to pay. Thank you for that. Um, leaving leaving on, a, on a low note, but um, <laughs> thanks so we much. We can leave for... on a high note. There's so much opportunity. <laughs> Let's leave on a high note. There's, it's wonderful as far as the opportunities we can engage each other and for god's sakes people collaborate oh my god reach out to the lawyers and you know it may it may rest in part with you to reach out to the lawyers because as i said the lawyers were there because they were the people who were smart but bad at math and they see the technology coming and sometimes they kind of glaze over and aren't paying a lot of attention to it so help them understand the value you bring to the conversation Thank you. Um, I shared a, a link in the chat here of a discourse post where we'll post the video and slides and other follow up things. But we did have a lot of questions in here that we didn't get to answer directly. But if you want to post them there, we can see about continuing the conversation. And if anybody wants to continue the conversation, I'm happy to be available. Um, that's one of the things education allows us to do is take the time to have these great conversations. So. So please feel free to ping me at Vermont Law School um, or I'll put my email address in the chat. Now, also put it on the discourse post too, if that's good. Um, thank you so much everybody and uh, time for our next session. Thanks so much everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.